Afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Welcome to our worship service. Uh, this is our last midweek Lenten uh, meditation based upon uh, Ezekiel, his life and ministry, and how that points us ahead to the Lord Jesus Christ and his passion. Uh, the order of service is uh, printed out for you in your service folder. Again, we're going to take a look at Ezekiel chapter 4 uh, this afternoon. Uh, our opening hymn, we have selected verses there. Uh, Hymn 397, verses 1 and 2, and also 6 and 7. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. The Lord be with you. Lord God, you brought us safely to this hour of evening prayer. We thank you for providing all that we need for body and life. Bless us who gathered in your name. Forgive our sins. Speak to our hearts. Dispel our sorrows with the comfort of your word. And receive our hymns of thanks and praise. Through Jesus Christ, our living Savior, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll join together in Psalm 141.
Let our prayers be acceptable in your sight. Come and help us in our time of need that we may sing your praise in holy joy now and forever through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm 13b. It's in hymn form. You can find it in the Gray Psalter book, page 57. Lord God, you are merciful and tender-hearted, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to us in our anguish over sin, and hear our cry for mercy, that we may be, may be at peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Passion History lesson tonight is taken from Luke chapter 23, beginning at the 26th verse. As they led Jesus away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us. To the hills cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the King of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the King of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. 
When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. It was preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed Joseph and saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it. Then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes, but they rested on the Sabbath in obedience to the commandment. This is the word of our God. We'll continue with him 404.
Grace, mercy, peace are all yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is Ezekiel chapter 4. The Lord says to Ezekiel, now son of man, take a clay tablet, put it in front of you and draw the city of Jerusalem on it, then lay siege to it. Erect siege works against it, build a ramp up to it, set up camps against it, and put battering rams around it. Then take an iron pan, place it as an iron wall between you and the city, and turn your face toward it. It will be under siege, and you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. Then lie on your left side and put the sin of the house of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days you will bear the sin of the house of Israel. After you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the house of Judah. I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. Turn your face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and with bared arm prophesy against her. I will tie you up with ropes, so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you have finished the days of your siege. Take wheat and barley, beans and lentils, millet and spelt. Put them in a storage jar and use them to make bread for yourself. You are to eat it during the 390 days you lie on your side. Weigh out 20 shekels of food to eat each day and eat it at set times. Also measure out a sixth of a hin of water and drink it at set times. Eat the food as you would a barley cake. Bake it in the sight of the people using human excrement for fuel. The Lord said, in this way, the people of Israel will eat defiled food among the nations where I will drive them. Then I said, not so, sovereign Lord, I've never defiled myself. From my youth until now, I've never eaten anything found dead or torn by wild animals. No unclean meat has ever entered my mouth. Very well, he said, I will let you bake your bread over cow cow manure instead of human excrement. He then said to me, son of man, I will cut off the supply of food in Jerusalem. The people will eat rationed food in anxiety and drink rationed water in despair, for food and water will be scarce. They will be appalled at the sight of each other and will waste away because of their sin. This is the word of our God. In the name of our Savior Jesus, fellow redeemed. In 1937, Angelo Hayes was 19 years old. He was driving too fast on his motorcycle one night, slammed into a wall. There his broken body was. They rushed him to the hospital. The doctors, finding no pulse, declared him to be dead. He was buried three days later. But wait a minute, the insurance company said. Something fishy is going on here, we think, because the father of Angelo Hayes had just carried out or taken out a huge life insurance policy on Angelo several days before his death. So the insurance company absolutely demanded that they dig up the body of Angelo Hayes to make sure it was actually in the coffin and that he was really dead. So very reluctantly they did that took the casket up out of the ground, pried it open with a crowbar, and they were shocked to discover that Angelo Hayes, his body was still warm. Angelo Hayes had been buried alive. You know, brothers and sisters of Christ, there are a lot of bad things that can happen to a person during his or her life. Being buried alive It's got to be right there at the very top, close to it. George Washington, I think, would agree with me. Do you know that George Washington, when he was filling out his last will and testament, had all of his kind of family members and friends gather around him and and made them absolutely promise, when I die, he said, wait two full days before you put my casket into the ground. He knew that being buried alive is just about as bad as it can get. It doesn't get worse than that. You know, as we've taken a look at these meditations based upon the prophet Ezekiel, his life and his ministry, 
you know, I wonder, was there a time or two that Ezekiel said, you know, it just can't get worse than this? I'm going to suggest this afternoon that right away in chapter 2, when Ezekiel is called into the ministry to be the prophet of God, I'm going to say it started out already bad for Ezekiel. Remember chapter 2? The Lord says, Ezekiel, I'm calling you to be my prophet. And the people you're going to speak to, these exiles in Babylon, they're a hard-hearted people. They're not going to listen to a word you have to say. In fact, he calls them scorpions, his own people. They're stiff-necked, hard-hearted. In fact, he says to his prophet Ezekiel, right there in the call, he says, you're going to have to make your forehead like flint, like rock, because you're going to be button heads with these people your whole ministry. Well, it starts out bad, I think, for Ezekiel, and it just kind of goes downhill from there. Case in point, chapter 4. Apparently, the people of Israel had gotten so hard-hearted, so thick-skulled, so spiritually poor and depraved, they weren't listening to what the Lord had to say, so God basically has to stoop down and have his prophet draw them a picture of what was going to happen. God had told the people through Ezekiel, Jerusalem is toast. It's going to be destroyed. The Babylonians are going to come surround it, going to destroy the city and the beautiful temple. But the people, those exiles, they said it's never going to happen. So in chapter 4, the Lord tells Ezekiel, this is what you're going to do. I want you to take a lump of clay. Let's, uh, for example, let's picture a cinder block sized lump of clay. It's soft, it's wet. He puts it on the ground, probably on the main drag somewhere where all the people are walking by. And he has Ezekiel draw an outline of the city of Jerusalem on top of that lump of clay. And in this first part of the picture, he has Ezekiel, you know, put all kinds of little toy soldiers around it. You know, back in the day, we had those little green army men, you know, something like to put all the toy soldiers around this little city, model city of, of Jerusalem, and build little ramps and walls. And the point was, every time the people walked by this picture, this street art, if you want to call it, or street theater, they were to remind, be reminded the Babylonians are coming. It's going to be very bad. They were to destroy the city of Jerusalem. They're going to park right around it. That was bad enough, but the second part of the picture gets even worse. And here's where things start to get a little bit weird. He says, Ezekiel, what I want you to do, first of all, is lie on your left side, like a sick person. The picture there is Ezekiel's bearing the sins of the people of Israel, the, you know, collectively the Lord, the sick and tired of the, the people's sins, lies down on his left side. 390 days. Can you imagine? I don't think it was 24 hours a day, but, you know, I go to bed at night, every 15 minutes I'm going back and forth because my hips are aching. I don't know about you. 390 days on one side. We don't really know what the number means exactly, but it's a large number. So he's facing north, and, and the point is God's wrath over that northern kingdom, which had already been destroyed, that's going to continue for a long time. And then he said, after you're done with that, over a year, right, go to the other side, the line on your right side, face south, 40 days. His wrath against that southern kingdom of Judah would last quite a bit less of an amount of time. Ezekiel, as you're lying there, I want you to take also an iron skillet. I'm going to say, let's, let's imagine a pizza pan. Everybody's probably got a pizza pan at home. So Ezekiel's lying on his side. He's right close to this lump of clay. And so he puts a pizza pan between him and, and this model city, Jerusalem. And that was saying to the people, God was saying, they're, they're, your sins have separated you from me. I'm so angry at you, I can't stand looking at you. There's this wall that separates us. And then on top of that, he has somebody tie up Ezekiel. And, and what does that mean? That means you're not getting out of this. 
the city of Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The Babylonians are coming. It's, it's going to happen. That's bad. But the third part of the picture, it's the worst of all. So Ezekiel's lying there. He's tied up the pizza pan. 390 days, 40 days. And all this time, the Lord says, what I want you to do is gather some, some food up, you know, grains. And, and only gather, though, the amounts listed here, only about half the amount a person needs to live each and every day. So half rations. Grind up that grain into flour, mix it with some water, make it into dough, and I want you to bake a little loaf of bread. But get this, right? Don't use wood for the fire. Don't use brush that's available to you around to make that fire. Take human waste, human excrement, light that on fire every single day and cook your bread over that. Can you imagine? What in all the world does that mean? What the Lord was trying to impress upon those exiles in Babylon is those people in Jerusalem, Babylonians are going to park around that city. Nothing's coming in, nothing's going out. No supplies are coming in. No fresh water, no firewood. Things are going to get so bad. Those people in that city of Jerusalem, they're going to slowly starve to death. And things are going to get so bad they're going to have to bake bread over their own human waste. Well, we're about 2,500 years removed from this account, give or take. So what's the message? It's a call to repentance, isn't it? I mean, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I think one of the things that, that we can learn from this count, first of all, is how embarrassing. How embarrassing, first of all, for Ezekiel. Did Ezekiel, when he's doing this, did he ever think, this is a low point in my ministry? Pastors today, we've got it easy, right? Beautiful pulpit to preach from, or we can preach up from here. Don't have to lie on our side back and forth for over a year. How embarrassing for Ezekiel, the spokesman for God, to have to lie in the dirt. And, and how many people didn't make fun of him, let's be honest? Laughing at him as he's doing all of this. How embarrassing for Ezekiel. How embarrassing for the people of Israel. People who should know so much better. They had the word of God and the temple and the priests and the prophets. But they're so thick-headed, so spiritually depraved that God has to stoop so low to have his prophet do all of these strange things because they're not listening to his word. How embarrassing for the Lord. You ever think about that? The Lord had coddled these people, pampered them, given them everything that they could possibly want or need, had given them the promise of the Savior, that the Savior of the world is coming through you. How embarrassing that the Lord has to go through all of this rigmarole. But brothers and sisters in Christ, how embarrassing still for us today, right? How embarrassing it is. You know, we've got the Word of God in, in the Bible on the, the nightstand. We've got a Bible app on our phone. We've got access to the Word of God. Our kids, our grandkids go to a Lutheran school, a lot of us. We should be miles ahead when it comes to our sanctification, shouldn't we? But how embarrassing it is, each and every one of us, myself included, we, that we have to go to the Lord every single day and ask his forgiveness for those same old sins. Call them pet sins if you want, the sins that we call, the, the, the things we know that are condemned by God's word, but we keep on doing them. And then we keep on going to the Lord asking for forgiveness. 
we just never seem to move ahead in our spiritual, our faith life. If you think I'm wrong, just imagine for a moment if there was a big screen, maybe a TV behind me, or maybe even this one. And somehow we got access to the real of your life. The DVD, whatever you want to call it. We know all of your sinful thoughts, all of your sinful actions, what you posted online. Maybe you had a couple of rants in there online or, or you had looked at something online. And all of that was displayed for everybody to see. We'd all bow our heads in shame, wouldn't we? Thank God, though, that we have a Savior from sin. Thank God that in Jesus Christ, those sins have been drowned in the depths of the ocean. You know, things were certainly bad for the people of Israel, but you know, God, God turned it around, didn't he? These people were, were just hard-hearted, and yet God, in his grace, still preserved a remnant through whom that Savior did come. It was so bad. Ezekiel 4, it looks like it's going down in flames, but the Lord rescues it and sends a Savior. Didn't the same thing kind of happen when that Savior came? I mean, you look at the ministry and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, from a marketing perspective, it was a complete disaster. Jesus was fairly popular, I suppose, kind of, sort of. John chapter 6, though, he starts talking about, I'm the bread of life. Believe in me. Trust in me. And then we read later in the chapter, many of his disciples no longer followed him. Jesus, his popularity plummets. In the Garden of Gethsemane, what do we see? His friends, people, 12 disciples, 11 disciples, people that he had been with for three years, teaching, caring for them. They all ran away in the dark, left him no support, no friendship. What a disaster. On the cross, it's even worse. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Lord of life, his own creatures spitting on him and mocking him, and he dies this humiliating death as a criminal on the cross. But God turned it all around, didn't he? What looks like a complete disaster, if you looked at the cross, you say, it can't get any worse than that. But God knew what he was doing. He was accomplishing your salvation and my salvation and giving us eternal life in heaven through that blood-stained cross. Remember Angelo Hayes we started with today? Angelo Hayes, they dug him up, literally. Body's warm. Rushed him back to the hospital. Weeks. Spent weeks recovering. He's, you know, 19, 20 years old. And then after that, he spends weeks, months rehabbing. And then he lives another 71 years. Dies at the ripe old age of 90. Kind of a perfectly healthy life after that. You're going to live too. In Jesus. Because Jesus went to that cross, he didn't avoid it. Didn't dodge it. He went through the worst case scenario. So that you and I might have the best kind of life. That eternal life in heaven. That he won for us. And, and the life that we look forward to. May God bless our holy week to come and Easter as we think about that cross and that empty tomb and what it means for us. Forgiveness, life, and salvation. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue with hymn number 405.
Let's rise. In the closing hours of this day, hear us as we pray, O Lord. For the well-being of people everywhere, for the growth of your church in all the world, and for the strengthening of all who serve and worship here, we pray, O Lord. For one another, young and old, for your blessings that come with every stage of life, and for joy in doing your will, we pray, O Lord. For our public servants who work day and night to bring protection, justice, learning, and health to this and every place, we pray to you, O Lord. For favorable weather and bountiful harvests, for clothing and food, for health of body, mind, and spirit, and for deliverance from all sin and every form of evil, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord For the faithful who've gone before us, who've shared with us your good news, whose souls are now at rest in your heavenly kingdom, we give you thanks, O Lord. In thanksgiving for your many and varied gifts to us, we now commend ourselves to your care. Be our shield and strength, O Lord. In our prayers this evening, we want to remember Brett Peterson, uh, the Peterson family, uh, North Campus for the most part. Uh, Trish is uh, Brett's wife. Uh, I think they're in the choir. He ended up in the ICU at Freighter. Kind of unclear as to what's going on, but obviously a serious situ situation. So we want to remember Brett Peterson in our prayers this evening. We bow our heads. Dear Lord Jesus, you went to the cross and, and sacrificed yourself to make payment for all of our sins. You took the biggest problem we would ever have in life, sin, death, power of the devil. You took all of those problems and soundly defeated them through your crucifixion, through your resurrection from the grave. We know that we have the complete forgiveness of all of our sins, life, and salvation, and we have a God, a Savior, who promises to be right there next to us each and every day. So, Lord, with that confidence, we ask that you would be with Brett Peterson as he struggles in the ICU. We ask, Lord, that if it is your will, you would bring him safely through whatever lies ahead. We ask, Lord, that you would bless him with a stronger faith, patience. Uh, if it is your will, we ask that you would grant him health and healing, or at least more time on this earth to enjoy his family and friends. Also be with the Peterson family, Trish, and, and the whole family. Again, direct their eyes to Easter morning and, and all that that means for us. Uh, give them confidence in, in the face of, of these present trials that they're facing. And confidence, of course, that you'll work it all together for their good. We pray for these things, Jesus, in your name as we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated. We'll close today with hymn 792. Afternoon, once again, everybody. It's great to see all of you here uh, today. A couple announcements to highlight. Uh, we have a fish fry uh, put on by Kingdom Prep uh, Monday, Thursday, but we need you to sign up if you're interested in that um, fish fry. Sign up sheets as you leave the church table to the left. Uh, to the right is a sign up sheet for Easter breakfast over at the uh, North Campus. Uh, they have a lot of great stuff there lined up for food and, and everything, so sounds good. If you want to uh, join uh, that Easter breakfast, sign up sheet uh, to the right. Uh, finally, I have had a call to St. John's, Fremont, Wisconsin. Uh, decided to return that call. Uh, so thank you very much for your prayers and your, your words of support. Have a blessed evening.